Bismillahir Rahman Nir Rahim. The Quranic Perspective on Apostasy. Slavery and Concubines. Translation of Kittal e Murtad, Hulam or Lundayan. Hulam Ahmed Perwes. Tului Islam Trust Registered. 25b, Gulberg 2, Lahore. About the author. Hulam Ahmed Perwes was born in Badhala, Punjab, in British India on July 9, 1903 into a profoundly religious family. His grandfather, who was deeply religious and belonged to the Hanafi school of thought, was a renowned religious scholar who intended to make the author inherit his knowledge and religious understanding. As a consequence, his education and training was carried out under the direction of his grandfather. While he studied the traditional religious teachings, he also had the desire and inkling to question its content using his intellect and reasoning. This led to his inner conflict with the external religious environment and he continued to question the prevalent religious concepts and practices. He noticed that whatever was being taught as part of the religion was being referred to some imam or religious scholar for authority. It was also noted in the religious literature that whatever the forefathers had followed should be obeyed without any question, and this was considered to be a requirement of Islam. For Perwes this did not satisfy his desire to seek reason and logic in every claim and statement made within the religious literature. However, he could not express these doubts and reservations initially due to his respect for his grandfather, and the constraints of the religious environment which prevailed at the time in his town. Later, due to his employment, he moved to Lahore, now part of Pakistan and found a degree of freedom to question some of these religious concepts and beliefs. After the death of his grandfather, he found complete freedom to pursue his line of inquiry and research into the prevalent Islamic beliefs, doctrines, ideologies, and religious practices. This led to his discovering that most of these have been acquired from others. He tried to study the Quran using the traditional religious approach but was unable to find the answers to all his doubts, which required satisfaction from a logical point of view. He also studied the life of the last messenger and the establishment of the Islamic State in the 7th century in his quest to determine the cause which contributed to this greatest revolution. Based on the Quran, he especially paid attention to the statement from the last messenger, the Quran is not a product of my thinking or that of any other human being and that this is the message from Allah. He soon learned the procedure to understand the Quran. Through his contact with the famous philosopher and poet, Alama Iqbal, who had a deep interest in the Quran, Perwes concluded that to understand the Quran one has to understand three fundamentally important points. The Quran calls itself light. Nur. And a light does not need any external source or aid to make itself visible. It makes itself evident and also exposes the reality of those things which are within its domain. The Quran is revealed in the Arabic language and to understand it correctly one needs to understand the Arabic context which was prevalent at the time of its revelation. The Quran has guided us by saying that through tasrif al -ayat, through cross-reference within the verses of the Quran, it makes its guidance clear e. g. 6. 106. In order to meet the second requirement regarding the precise meaning of the Arabic words in the Quran, he researched and compiled a Lugat al Quran. Now translated into English. Which is a dictionary of all the words and terms used in the Quran, and which includes the meanings which were prevalent among the Arabs at the time of the revelation of the Quran. For the third requirement of Tasrif al -Ayat, the Quran is different from books written by human beings. Where the latter are usually divided based on various subjects, the Quran is based on mentioning a reality in one verse or verses and then its further explanation is noted in another place or places. For example, in Surah Al-An'am the Quran states, And thus do we explain the signs by various verses, so that they acknowledge you have explained them, and we make the Quran clear for a people who know. 6. 105. In order to meet this requirement, Perwes felt the need to compile all the verses under one subject as referred in various verses of the Quran, and he compiled a book in Urdu titled Tabwe Bal Quran. Classification of the Quran. 
This made it easy to refer to various subjects and look at all the verses mentioned in the Quran relating to a subject. Along with writing and producing literature on the Quran, Perwes also held a regular weekly meeting in Lahore to deliver a dars. Lecture explaining the Quran. In Urdu, and these are also available as audio and video recordings. He dedicated most of his life to researching the Quran and its significance in relation to presenting an alternative solution to human problems. And answering questions relating to human creation, its purpose, and the question of death and the next life. He also participated in the struggle for independence during the period 1938-1947 and the creation of Pakistan which was based on the ideology of the Quran, with a view to establishing an Islamic state for the Muslims of the subcontinent. He worked very closely with the founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Quaidi Azam or great leader, and had regular discussions with him on various aspects of the message of the Quran. In order to support the movement for a separate state for the Muslims of India, and to counter the arguments put forward by some of the religious lobby who opposed the creation of Pakistan, he published a monthly journal called Talu'i Islam, Dawn of Islam, commencing in 1938. Perwes joined the Indian Civil Service in the Home Department in 1927. And after the creation of Pakistan he migrated to Karachi and continued to serve in the same department till 1955 when he took early retirement and devoted the rest of his life fully to his work on the Quran. He moved to Lahore from Karachi and settled there. He left this life on February 24, 1985 in Lahore and his body was laid to rest in Lahore. Forward. Though man is born free, those people who somehow or other gather wealth and power into their hands, by seizing the freedom of human beings, they make them their slaves and dependent on them. The Quran was sent down so that this expropriated freedom of theirs could be returned to them. Rasulullah established such a society in the light of the Quran in which no man was the subject or dependent of another man. And accepting those boundaries which Allah had prescribed for mankind. The aim of which was the nourishment of the self of man and the establishment of peace and security within human society, there was no constraint imposed on anyone. After some time, this map of society changed and wealth and power again came into human hands, as a result of which those people owning wealth and power made men their dependents and subjects. Not only dependents and subjects, in fact, slaves. Consequently, history inform us that in the harems of each and every caliph there used to be thousands of concubines. In the capital, there were specific markets where human beings were auctioned. Men were made slaves and women were made concubines. And the irony was this, that the religious clergy had issued a fatwa that all of this is legitimate according to Shariat. All this was taking place through the auspices of the ruling junta. On the other side were the custodians of Shariat, the state of whose authority was such that if any individual differed even slightly from them, they would declare that he has become a murtad. Apostate. And since the punishment for apostasy is death, he would be consigned to the sword. The pages of our history are stained with these blood-soaked accounts. After the creation of Pakistan. When this possibility arose that Islamic laws will be implemented here. Some people raised this question as to whether slavery will be introduced here, and will Muslims be killed on the basis of religious differences. In reply to this. The representative of our orthodox sector, Syed Abul Alamat Yudi, wrote with great vehemence that when other laws of Shariat will be established here, then why would the commands of Shariat about slavery and the killing of a murtad not be implemented? In reply to these articles of his, detailed commentaries were written in Talu'i Islam, in which it was stated that slavery and the killing of a murtad are absolutely against the teaching of the Quran, therefore, how can they be allowed in Islam? In view of the significance of these commentaries, they were later compiled in the form of a booklet and published. That booklet was unavailable for a time. Consequently, following revision, it is being published again. The aim of this is to make this fact clear to those readers with a questioning and intellectual outlook. What is meant by Islamic laws according to the orthodox sector? 
and if these laws are implemented in Pakistan, which these people declare as Islamic, then what will be the state of the country and what will be our position in front of the world? It should be borne in mind that these two topics have been presented merely as examples. Otherwise, the case is that most of those matters which these people declare as being Islamic laws, and because of which objections are raised against Islam on an almost daily basis, are actually contrary to the Quran. The third article in the booklet mentioned above was about the inheritance of an orphaned grandchild. The decision of the law of shariat of these people is that if the father of a child dies while the grandfather is alive, then this orphaned grandchild cannot receive a share of the inheritance from his grandfather. This issue was also clarified by Talui Islam. That this decision is blatantly against the Quran. By the grace of Allah, the law of the country has accepted the right of an orphaned grandchild to a share of the inheritance. On this basis, there is no need to include this article in this booklet. We hope that people who have vision will find these articles useful from the Islamic and human point of view. The stance of Talui Islam is that any law which is against the Quran can never be declared to be an Islamic law, and it is this very proclamation on account of which it receives so much opposition. Salam. Talui Islam Trust. 25B, Goldberg 2, Lahore. Lahore. June 1962. Editorial Note. This is an English translation of the Urdu pamphlet titled Kittali Murtad, Hulam or Lundayan authored by G. A. Perwes and published by Talui Islam, Lahore, Pakistan. Two important topics are discussed by the author which many non-Muslims inquire about, namely the position of Islam regarding the issue of apostasy, and that of slaves and concubines when the Quran linked the purpose of human creation to the law of requital. It made it absolutely clear to man that whatever he does during his life on this planet, nothing will escape the eye of this law of Allah. If he keeps this law in mind during his life, he will always be aware of the consequences of everything he does. Since man possesses choice and intent, it soon became clear to him that this law does work in his life, but despite this, most disregard it. The disorder which we witness in the world around us is a consequence of ignoring this basic law. While it continues to ensure that whatever we do individually, or collectively, reaps its inescapable consequences. Regarding this law, the Quran states, Allah created the heavens and the earth for just ends. Hacked. And in order that each self may find the recompense of what it has earned, and none of them be wronged. 45. 22. The Quran made the following facts clear at a fundamental level. Every child is deserving of respect and dignity by virtue of possessing choice and intent, and due to the fact that the universe owes its existence to the creation of man, as noted in the verse above. The creation of man is for a higher purpose of life, this world being the first stage of his existence, and after his physical death, he, his self, We'll move on to the next stage of evolution. The Quran describes the two concepts of life which man will opt for in order to live in this world. 1. That his life ends with physical death, if his view is that there is nothing within him which can advance beyond this earthly life. Or, 2. That life at the level of his self continues on beyond this physical death, which implies that he has something within him which can survive this. Man has the choice to structure his earthly life based purely on the decisions of his intellect alone. And the Quran has spelled out the kind of world which will emerge as a consequence of this choice. Or he can choose to employ his intellect within the domain of Wahi, the Quran, and create an entirely new world in which he will be able to live a life free from fear and grief. 2. 38. The world which we witness around us is based on the creation of the human intellect alone. Devoid of the light of Wahi, and both fear and grief encompass this life both at an individual and at a collective level from all directions. The attribute of choice and intent as part of the manifestation of the human self at a fundamental level meant that man must have maximum freedom and liberty to make decisions in his earthly life. However, if he lives according to the functioning of his intellect alone, 
then due to the limitations of this he will remain trapped within the influences of his unchecked desires and emotions and will not be able to enjoy the maximum potential of his capacity as a human being. For this, he was provided with the guidance of Wahi by Allah through his designated messengers. The final guidance was completed within the Quran and passed on to mankind until the last day as far as this planet is concerned. Under the guidance of the Quran, a model Islamic welfare state based on the system of deen was established through the hands of Rasulullah. Peace be upon him. The final messenger of Allah. And his companions during the 7th century AD, which, though it did not survive very long, presented itself as a model forevermore for the rest of mankind I. E. If this could be implemented at that time, then it can be implemented again at any time if mankind wishes. Those Muslims who, after voluntarily accepting Islam, established the system of deen at that time, witnessed the true freedom which it provided to them. However, it did not endure for long, and subsequent generations of Muslims abandoned it and did not return to the system of deen for the next many centuries. This model of the Islamic State eliminated slavery in all its forms, while respect and dignity for a human being was restored to the same status as that which was advocated by the Quran. All men were declared as being equal, and were willingly and joyfully treated as such within the boundaries of this state. Both men and women enjoyed the same freedoms within their own specific areas of responsibility. There was no fear and grief in this state, the Quran was their constitution, and the system truly recognized the sovereignty of Allah within the boundaries of this Islamic state. Those who managed the affairs of the state accepted the following with full willingness. Allah is the ruler of the Islamic system and his rule is established through the Quran. And since everyone is equal before Allah's law, the concept of ruler and ruled is eliminated. Through mutual consultation they formulated sub-clauses within the bounds of the laws and values given by the Quran in order to meet the requirements of the time. But they were fully conscious of the fact that they did not have the authority to alter any of the laws and values of the Quran. Those at the helm of affairs enjoyed the full freedom provided to them by the Quran I. E. They were not subjects of any man-made laws, and they enjoyed this freedom together with their fellow citizens, Muslim and non-Muslim. Since their selves had become developed to a high level of eminence, they had no desire to have their own personal rule imposed on their fellow citizens. Any constraints that were felt by non-Muslims were not imposed externally by the state but were related to the absence of the inner psychological freedom which is associated with the guidance of Wahi. The human psyche became transformed as a result of following Wahi and removed all false concepts of Allah. This is why no one demanded of the last messenger that we wish to see Allah with our own eyes, as previous peoples had demanded from their messengers, the reason was evidently clear. They recognized the inner reality of their self and accepted the concept of Allah as explained in the Quran which served as a model for them. The emergence of this newly created self within them was sufficient evidence of the outcome of following the guidance of the Quran. They could see clearly through their newly created vision that which Allah wished them to see in the light of his book. Each citizen who wholeheartedly opted to become a Muslim recognized his own significance as a creation of Allah. Having reached this level of development of the self, they fully appreciated the significance of human freedom both as a physical being and psychologically, and never thought to subjugate their fellow human beings, men, or women. This was the reason why slavery in all its forms vanished from the society within just one generation. However, those who subsequently usurped power, or who let power slip away, instead of living under the sovereignty of Allah, they replaced it with human rule. They failed to appreciate their freedom under Allah's sovereignty, and thus reintroduced the enslavement of human beings, the elimination of which was, and is, one of the aims of the Quran. The situation gradually went from bad to worse, and humanity sank once again into a deep quagmire of darkness as Maluki yet established an iron grip on human affairs in those lands which were occupied by these Muslims. The Quran was put aside, and all the bounties associated with its guidance vanished. Human beings debased themselves to the subhuman level, and subsequent generations lost sight of it completely, 
and this age of darkness continues to prevail in the world today. As happens under such circumstances. Men produced all kinds of writings to justify evil in order to satisfy their base desires and emotions. And since they found it hard to convince the public at large in the presence of the Quran, they concocted a hadith two to three hundred years after the death of Rasulullah and attributed these to him. With the passage of time, these attributions became embedded within the beliefs of the Muslims and were commonly accepted as being the sayings of Rasulullah. While the Quran took a back seat and remained as a book which was only to be read in order to gain some kind of abstract sawab through the blind recital of its words without any kind of true comprehension whatsoever. This resulted in the death of Muslims as a whole, those who had once upon a time acquired a new life through the guidance of the Quran. Though this book deals specifically with the issues of apostasy, slavery and concubines as documented and propagated in books promoting sectarian religious Islam, readers can extrapolate its points and apply them to all manner of slavery which continues to exist under various cloaks throughout the world. Some of these are visible while others are more insidious, and can be imposed both externally or internally, by man upon man, and by groups of men upon the population at large. For example, economic slavery, in which people live in perpetual financial hardship and dread of poverty, and which is created by the capitalist system of the world, and as a consequence of which most of humanity is never able to exercise their choice and intent even at the lowest level of their existence. The irony is that though there are major campaigns concerning issues such as global warming, little action is taken on remedying poverty and economic slavery. It appears to be of greater concern to these campaigners to try and save humanity from drowning at some point of time in the future due to melting ice caps, rising sea levels, and floods caused by apparent rising temperatures on the planet, than it is to address the current daily privations resulting from unremitting poverty. Other forms of slavery are self-imposed by man as a result of different religious belief systems e.g. Fatalism Kismat superstitions, divisions of race, class, and caste, etc. Another kind of widespread slavery or mental subjugation is via nationalism, where people genuinely believe that patriotism defines the identity of their self. The irony is that when those same people change their nationality ten they embrace their newly acquired patriotism as a fresh identity with great ease, the same human being acquires a new self by Assuming a different sense of identity. A similar type of slavery is a self-imposed political belief system. An individual allies himself with a certain political party and then sells his soul to the leader and the objectives of this party. Under the banner of party loyalty, he supports the party manifesto, some of which he may agree with, but other parts of which may include clauses which are tantamount to giving up personal freedoms. But in the name of allegiance he votes for it and if the party comes into power, then he indirectly applies more chains around his own neck and proceeds to lose even more of his already strangled freedoms. The proof for this can be seen worldwide in the divisions caused by this democracy, with endless debates, discussions, radio shows, news articles, etc. which throw light on the internal divisions among the population. But no one addresses this question, what is the purpose of human creation, why do we exist in this world for only a finite duration, and why do we eventually die? From the above, let us examine these forms of slavery through an example. An individual who is born into a Muslim household will firstly hold the beliefs of the sect of Islam of that household. Then he will acquire his nationalistic identity. He will then affiliate himself with a particular party and leader, and can change these loyalties if he wishes depending on the political conditions of his country. He will venerate many human models of his own choice. Or as presented by the society and culture as he progresses through life, these will all form part of his belief system, and create a cognitive dissonance impacting his psyche and decision-making powers. In this whole confusion of beliefs there is nothing about the creation of a new self which is based on the permanent values and the life in the hereafter. He will remain enslaved to these beliefs. Either imposed on him or acquired through choice. 
thinking these to be true since others around him are following the same pattern. Most will never question this condition and may not even be fully conscious of it. Living life like this, bound by these chains. Is this the purpose of life? Is this the freedom which man deserves, when there is another life waiting for him in the hereafter? Those who enslaved themselves over and above the chains placed on them by the elite of the political system? failed to comprehend or appreciate the freedom which the Quran offered them, and as a consequence fabricated such a hadith which brought back that slavery and punishment for apostasy, which the Quran had arrived to eliminate, and which had been eliminated in the earlier era of Rasulullah. The religious clergy acquired the power to declare fatwas on the citizens and through these subjugated them using coercion and compulsion. This severely curtailed free thought, so that hardly any intellectual development took place during this period, despite possessing the Quran. That same Quran which continuously addresses the human intellect to help it to expand its horizons to ever greater expanses. So that man becomes aware of the significance of his own reality within the universe, and even beyond this. The Books of G. A. Perwes throw light on various aspects of the Quranic system of Deen and the importance of the role of a human being in establishing this system according to the demands of the time. So that man can develop his understanding and recognize his role as a junior companion in the universe partaking in Allah's creation in order to achieve true freedom. Man takes over that part of his creation where Allah has given him free reign. So that he can change the face of the earth physically. As well as intellectually, and can achieve great enhancements in consciousness which he could never otherwise have achieved without the light of Wahi. Even without the light of the Quran, man is still aware of his freedom to choose, particularly those who are not constrained by slavery as imposed through religious beliefs. They assume that once the human body meets death there is no possibility of another life in the hereafter, with the death of the physical body, man is dead. We see around us how man has changed the face of the earth through research and innovations in science and technology. Those of us who come to grips with the concept of the possibility of creating a new self through the acceptance of Iman, open themselves to the realm of a new inner reality where they can use this new technology for the good of the whole of mankind. In order to usher in a new era in the world which is free from the shadow of fear and grief, it is not just some utopian concept of human life, but it is going to become a reality at some point in the future. 9. 33. Human life which is lived under layers self-imposed erroneous beliefs and then further subjected to the slavery of man-made laws imposed by those who themselves do not know the purpose of life, is akin to living in darkness upon darkness. The Quran states, or, the state of those who manifest kafir is like the depths of darkness in a vast deep ocean, overwhelmed with billow topped by billow, topped by dark clouds. Depths of darkness, one above another. 24. 40. The literature, including a hadith, which has been written by those who were the product of the system of Maluki Yat, and who never understood the significance of the Quran as a complete book of guidance is a production of whatever their intellect housed as a belief system in their own era and conform to whatever was existing at that time. Even today, if we look at the literature around the world, we will mostly see a reflection of the environment in which those writers are brought up. In his book, The Human Self and Ibels, Perwes has written about the thought process of Rasulullah, who, despite being born in a restrictive environment, question the issues facing mankind. Just ponder that in this environment, from the ignorant and savage land of Arabia, a human being stands up. As has been noted previously, he should have been the same as the people around him. And even if his intellectual level is assumed to be higher than the people around him, then at the very most he could have been declared to be a wise man of that civilized world and what the condition was of the civilized world of that era has been discussed above. But that individual rises and raises the flag of rebellion against every single one of those aspects of that structure of life which was declared as being precisely in accordance with nature by the 
civilization and culture and knowledge and wisdom of that era. He becomes introduced as the claimant of such a revolution in which the very foundations of this structure of lies are uprooted and cast aside. He declares Maliki yet to be the worst curse of Allah. Superstition is stated to be contrary to human dignity and he pronounces priesthood to be a saintly veil of self-deception. The division of caste and creed is counted as among the tyranny of pharaonic powers. According to him, the capitalist system is such a leprosy which has filled the body of humanity with fatal germs. His soul shivers at the thought of slavery. His proclamation about nationalism is that man acquires the form of bloodthirsty beasts as a consequence of this. He rises up, and calling on the whole world, proclaims that no human being has the right to rule over another human being. He states that the connection of man with Allah is direct. For this, there is no need for any intermediate medium of priesthood. He announces that the criterion for human eminence and dignity and status and righteousness is his character and deeds, the foundation of which is on Iman. No man has priority and superiority over another human being by virtue of birth. He states that capitalism is nothing more than that a few men, by acquiring power, have usurped the rights of weak and helpless human beings. Hence, the demand of justice and accountability is that these usurped rights are snatched back from the hands of these usurpers and returned to the rightful claimants. He declares accumulation and hoarding to be a severe crime in the economic system and announces that the circulation of wealth should not be in such a way that it remains circulating within one particular category. He states that man as simply being a human being is in itself a reason for respect for him, hence, even the very notion of slavery among human beings cannot arise. By shattering all tribal and national prejudices. He makes the announcement of this supreme revolution that the whole of mankind is one as a result of its origin. Therefore all people on the face of the earth are members of one universal brotherhood and are branches of one high and mighty tree. The creation of differentiation and differences in them through the unnatural barriers of race, color, language, and nationhood, is the breaking into pieces of the body of humanity. So much so, that he makes a proclamation against all the non-natural laws and constitutions of human life. Individual and collective. And not only does he make a proclamation, but also by generating a revolution, demonstrates what is the true significance of human life. This is how the human intellect grasps the reality of human creation through the light of Wahi. And matters which would have remained hidden from us otherwise, become evident when we use the light of the Quran. Those who do not apply their intellect according to the light of Wahi can never comprehend the true significance of the possession of choice and intent, and cannot visualize life in the hereafter as a reality. Religious emotive beliefs can provide some kind of concept of a hereafter, but it is not based on fact and is thus flawed and deceptive. This is the reason why the concept of the hereafter which exists in even the three Abrahamic religions is at variance with each other, as is the concept of God. Perwes provides a detailed discussion on this aspect in his book titled, The Human Self and Allah. The Quran arrived to eliminate all kinds of slavery, whether physical or psychological, and declared that each human child, by virtue of possessing choice and intent, has dignity and respect which is inviolable. Even if he commits a crime, he is a human being, and must be treated with respect and dignity while being punished for the crime, and this includes offering him opportunities to reform himself. The Quran proclaims that human beings are created for a lofty purpose, they are born free and must remain free. And this is not a utopian idea but achievable during our finite earthly life. Simply alter thinking by bringing the intellect within the guidance of the light of the Quran, and the reality of the purpose of creation and of existence itself will become manifestly clear. The Quran states that this is bound to take place. Soon will we show them our signs in the universe, and in their own selves, until it becomes manifest to them that this is the truth. Is it not enough that your Rab does witness all things? 41. 53. I wish to thank and acknowledge the support provided by Hussein Kais Rani of Tulu Islam Trust, Lahore. Salim Khan of Idara Tulu Islam, Lahore, and Asif Jalil from Bazam Tulu Islam, Karachi.
I am also grateful to Dr. Hamid Mian from New York for suggesting the title for this booklet. Finally, this work is a translation and as such any ambiguity in the text in the English version which is not present in the Urdu version is my responsibility as a translator and editor, and not of the original author. If readers have any questions or comments after reading this work, they are welcome to contact Talui Islam. Dr. Ijaz Rasool. Glasgow, UK.